All right, good afternoon, perhaps good morning, or even good evening, depending on where you are in the world as ever for our international edition of PON Live. Today, the program on negotiation is delighted to present this event entitled How Faith Leaders Can Help or Hurt Israeli-Palestinian Peacemaking Lessons from Northern Ireland. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I'm the Managing Director of the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. The Program on Negotiation is a consortium of Harvard University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Tufts University. And for nearly 40 years now, the Program on Negotiation has led the world in research, curriculum development, and executive education trainings related to the fields of negotiation, mediation, and conflict resolution. And we are delighted to present this series of events in our online classroom. So today's participants come from all over the world and we are starting to see folks putting in the chat where they are joining us from. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. And like our participants, today's panelists come from all over the world from our own Harvard Business School faculty member and PON Vice Chair, Jim Sabanius, who joins me from Cambridge, Massachusetts, to the Reverend Dr. Gary Mason uh, in Northern Ireland, Alana Simka in Belgium and Gregory Khalil in New York. Uh, the panel will be speaking for a good portion of the hour and at the conclusion of their discussion, there will be time for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of Zoom to uh, put your question into, uh, into the Q&A part. If you have a comment at any point, of course, you can always write it in the chat. This talk is being recorded and it will be posted on the PON website in about a week. I'd like as ever to thank the wonderful PON staff for their hard work in planning and orchestrating this event today, specifically Dr. Shula Gilad, Diane Long, Billy Fairfield, and James Kerwin. Thank you all for your hard work. And with that, I am delighted to hand the virtual Zoom microphone over to what is truly an all-star panel, beginning of course with our moderator, Jim Sabanius, PON Vice Chair of Practice Focused Research. Jim, thank you, and the floor is now yours. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks to all those who've made this uh, this this possible. Um, as uh, as you said, I'm Jim Sabinius. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School. I direct the Harvard Negotiation Project, which is part of PON, and uh, we have a marvelous panel, which I'll very briefly introduce shortly. This uh, this focus on how faith leaders, ministers, priests, rabbis, imams, can help or hurt Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. And the specific focus is lessons from Northern Ireland. And the discussion was inspired by the BBC documentary film, Fools for Christ. I hope many in the audience were able to see it. You've got a, a link to that film. Um, but if you weren't able to do so, we'll try to make today's conversation largely self-contained. One clarification, since I received several emails that this panel might somehow be insulting to Christians because its, it's title was Fools for Christ. Just a quick word, that actually, those words come from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, who famously began, we are fools for Christ's sake. And what that actually means is flouting society's conventions to serve a religious purpose, like joining an ascetic cult or, uh, or order. In the case of this film, seeming to act against the strong beliefs of many in one's own faith community in, uh, in conflict situations. So Fools for Christ um, is, is intended, uh, well, that's really the source, and it's intended as a, as a, a provocative introduction. You've, uh, you've heard briefly where our panelists are coming from. Uh, Reverend Dr. Gary Mason, a Methodist minister and PhD psychologist, directs the Conflict Transformation Organization in Belfast called Rethinking Conflict. He was deeply involved in the Northern Ireland peace process, concluding in the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 and since. He advised ex-Protestant paramilitary combatants. His church was the stage from which loyalist Paris announced their weapons decommissioning. And I've seen Gary on his work in the Middle East for a number of years now. Ilana Sumka, a rabbinical student, founder of Shlemut, which, and to support Jewish leaders to align with their spiritual and social justice values in their approaches to Israel and Palestine. She founded the Center for Jewish Nonviolence and is an activist to end the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. And Greg Khalil, who is speaking to us from New York, a Palestinian American, adjunct professor at Columbia, a former member of the Palestinian Negotiation Support Unit and founder and president of Telos, which is a DC-based nonprofit that often brings faith leaders, especially evangelical Christians, to Israel and Palestine to give them a firsthand knowledge of the conflict. So we've really got some great people who've uh, volunteered to, to share some of their insights. 
And I have some introductory questions for our panelists. Um, we'll leave some time for, uh, for Q&A. But, um, but to frame things, the roles that we saw in that film and more generally for faith leaders in uh, conflict situations, some of them consist of grassroots uh, efforts and within their own faith communities, improving mutual understanding, advocating for peace and so forth. Sometimes more specific roles, connecting with your own influential players on your own side. And that's tricky. As you saw from the film, sometimes Protestant ministers in Northern Ireland found it actually harder and more personally risky to meet with members of their own religious group, for example, loyalists, than to meet with, quote, the other side. Well, there's one actions within one's own faith community, but there's also general interfaith dialogue. And, um, and a lot of people have, uh, have uh, believe in its importance, whether in the longer term or, or otherwise, as well as indirect and direct political roles in, uh, in, in the overt negotiations themselves, whether those are public or private roles. And I think it's interesting that most political negotiations in both Northern Ireland and the Middle East overtly distance themselves from faith leaders, maybe fearing that that would make the conflict more overtly religious and that would make it more intractable. We wonder if that's been a mistake and whether the inclusion might be the case. Well, that's enough of kind of a framing. So I'd like to start with Gary, who, um, and Gary, you've emphasized that religion can be both uh, toxic and a force for good in conflict situations. And if you could briefly summarize some of the roles that Catholic and Protestant leaders played in Northern Ireland that might be replicated in some form in the Middle East conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, we saw some very high profile opponents like Reverend Ian Paisley, and the film showed us some other very quiet bridge builders and influencers. But Gary, welcome, and uh, I'd love to get your insights. Yes, thank you, Jim, and great to be with you virtually as we spent the last two years having these conversations. The first thing for me, I think, as a religious leader is that we need to allow honesty and integrity to spill into these spaces. I think sometimes as religious leaders, we have this tendency to protect our tribe and not have the honesty to acknowledge where religion has got it wrong. I mean, let me quote uh, Jonathan Sachs, the late Jonathan Sachs, a brilliant Jewish scholar, where Jonathan Sachs said, on one point, and it is a substantial one, the critics of religion are right. Religion has done harm. It has led to crusades, jihads, inquisitions, and pogroms. It has shed the blood of human sacrifice in the name of high ideals. People have hated in the name of the God of love, practiced cruelty in the name of the God of compassion, and waged war in the name of the God of peace and killed in the name of the God of life. Those are undeniable facts and they are terrifying. So I think the first thing, particularly in my space, Jim, church leaders needed to acknowledge we've got this wrong. The history of faith in this island of Ireland at times has been shameful. And I think that allowed us to be able to speak into those very difficult, fragmented spaces. Uh, you mentioned a religious leader there and who made some very volatile speeches in our space, which did drive many young men of my generation to pursue political violence. But on the other hand, I do believe that religious leaders do have a moral framework that they can bring in the very, very difficult spaces. I've often said, as we looked at many of the groups in our space that were highlighted in that uh, documentary, and primarily they were men. And I often said, if you lock 40 men in a room, listening to their own reassuring voices, it is a recipe for disaster. So for me, the role of religious leaders is to bring a moral framework and speak into those spaces and offer what I've called attractive alternatives. I think religious leaders have the moral authority to do that. And I think, Jim, as you alluded there to, many times religious leaders have been shut out of these spaces, I think completely wrongly. I mean, I'm working on a project at the moment with the uh, United States Institute for Peace, Inclusive Peace, and the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy in Washington, DC, really looking at the role of religious actors and formal peace political transition processes. 
what were the roles, their influences, their impact, their effectiveness. And so far that research is showing categorically that it is important that religious actors are at the table. I know some rabbi colleagues in the uh, Israeli-Palestinian theater have suggested to me that one of the reasons that Oslo never really got off the ground is because there were not religious actors at the table. And it was interestingly when some of our more, uh, let's say, uh, fundamentalist theological people in my space uh, were wanting to take strategic risks. Uh, they spoke to a wide range of religious leaders. Sometimes they may not have shared their theology, but even they realized that they needed to create a critical mass of people if we were going to actually move this peace process forward. Uh, religious leaders here also acted as back channels on many, many occasions. I mean, I often kind of describe myself at times for both the British, the Irish, and the American administration, the technical word as we know within negotiations is interlocutors. I often said that sometimes I felt I was like a temperature reader with a thermometer, putting it into someone's mouth to decide, is this person telling me the truth or not? And can I go back to certain people, be it in the British, Irish or American administrations and say, yes, I think these people genuinely are willing to move forward. So I want to say a category, yes, that religious actors have a very significant role to play. But I think in doing that, we need to acknowledge the toxic side of religion that has spilled into so, so many spaces on planet Earth across all our religious traditions. I think if we do that, people see that we're not in there to kind of lay out our own stall, but we're willing to shine a light in what can be very dark spaces in relation to religious chaos. Gary, that's very helpful. And, um, and I wonder if I might turn to Ilana. Uh, you've been very active within the Jewish community. And what did you see in the film or from your own knowledge of the Northern Ireland experience that suggests constructive roles that faith leaders, especially rabbis, imams in the Middle Eastern conflict could play? And I, we'd also be interested, as, uh, as, as we heard from Gary, in something of, of your own journey into this, uh, into this work. Thanks, Jim. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me the most from the film when I, when I feel into it from a sort of inner spiritual sense is this moment when one of the leaders asks, what am I called to do? I think it's a very deep question for a person of faith to ask him or herself. And when I asked myself that question, I think about the early years when I lived in Israel. I moved to Israel in 2004. And I, I felt very called to go to Israel. As an American Jew, it's a, almost a rite of passage to spend, if not a year, at least you know, a significant amount of time traveling, learning, studying. I had the huge privilege of having two years of fellowships to study um, in Israel in a modern Orthodox school of learning. And if you'd asked me in that time what I felt called to do, I would have given a very narrow answer. I didn't feel called at all to do anything having to do with Israelis and Palestinians. That would have been the truth. But I had a friend who was insistent that I come with her into the West Bank. and. Despite my fear of Palestinians, despite my reluctance, fears of my own safety, I decided to go. She was running a program called Encounter. And for various reasons, I had to leave Bethlehem by myself on that trip. Even though normally we stayed together as a group, I had a meeting I had to get back to in Jerusalem. I went back by myself through this checkpoint. I'd never been through a checkpoint before. I didn't really know what checkpoints were. I didn't understand how they worked. The Bethlehem checkpoint is a huge military installation. There are no signs that help you navigate your way through. And because I was there in the middle of the day, all the turnstiles were closed. And at a certain point, when I couldn't figure out where to go, I was locked on the side that I didn't want to be on. I shouted out to ask for help. And all of a sudden, out of I don't know where, an Israeli soldier appeared shooting, not shooting, thank God, not shooting, pointing a gun at me 
and I was afraid that I was going to be shot. I normally had been on the side with the Israeli soldiers, and this was the first time I'd been faced with confronting an Israeli soldier. And in that moment, I, I realized that that was a fraction of the vulnerability that a Palestinian experience is going through a checkpoint. And it was then that when the question came to me, what am I called to do? Everything in my life really pivoted towards realizing that I, I did have a responsibility to play um, because I had been so poorly uneducated. And actually I wanna add sort of a short rabbinic Talmudic tale. The Talmud has this beautiful and classic story in which two of our famous rabbis, Akiva and Darfon, Tarfon ask, in this debate back and forth, you know, we say two Jews, three opinions. Um, and in their debate, they were asking, what's, what's more important, education or action? And one side says action, one side is education, but then ultimately the, the rabbis side with Rabbi Akiva because he says education is more important because it leads to action. I think that's one of the roles that Jewish leaders have a responsibility to play, which is to deeply educate themselves, to put themselves in the shoes of the other and to practice radical empathy, which at its best is one of the most important values I think that Judaism and all religions have to offer. I'll just maybe add one or two more things about sort of how I came to this work and how I myself have transitioned along the way with it as a, as a Jewish leader. I did spend the next five years becoming the Encounter Jerusalem director. And I brought hundreds and hundreds of Jewish leaders into the West Bank on these educational programs because I thought it was so important for people from my, um, from my Jewish community to understand what was happening for Palestinians under occupation. But there was also a point when, um, I saw that circumstances on the ground continue to deteriorate for Palestinians. And there was a point that I reached where education no longer felt sufficient, necessary and important. Um, but in 2014, I got a phone call from Dawood Nasser, who's a Palestinian who owns a farm in the south of Bethlehem. Um, and the Israeli army had just uprooted hundreds of trees on his land in order to pave way for settlements. And I asked him how I could help and he said, it would be really meaningful if you brought a Jewish delegation here to replant trees that the Israeli army uprooted to show that your Jewish values aren't represented by the Israeli army's bulldozers. So one of the roles that, I, that I've taken very seriously since that pivotal transformative moment at the checkpoint is the extent to which, because the Israeli government is acting in my name as a Jewish person, if I don't want to be implicated in that, I have a responsibility as to my fellow Jewish leaders to speak out and say that those injustices are not taking place in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. And Greg, if I could turn to you um, initially, um, you're a scholar of an often neglected but hugely significant role of Christian Zionists in the Middle East. And perhaps refracted through that lens, and having watched the uh, watched the film, what insights would you suggest that religious leader uh, for religious leaders to play uh, constructive roles, especially in the Middle East, but drawing on drawing on the Northern Irish experience? Well, Jim, great to be here. Such an honor, and especially with Gary um, and Il Ilana, both of whom I know well. And Gary, I learned so much about Northern Ireland from in Belfast on a number of occasions, and I look forward to subsequent visits. Um, I might take a little bit of a step back, Jim, um, at this point, because I think that um, with negotiations specifically on Israel-Palestine, with general uh, conversations around geopolitics, or even our domestic issues here in the States, we have a blind spot in the public square. And that blind spot is towards religion. It's not simply illiteracy, it's antipathy. And we as human beings are religious beings. We're social beings. And one of the ways that we organize um, ourselves into tribes and identities is through religion. And that's always going to be the case, whatever we feel about it um, on this call. And that may sound a little basic, but the reason why I raise that is when I worked on the Israeli-Palestinian negotiating uh, negotiations advising the Palestinian leadership, um, I think all of us in the 
class, we wanted to will religion away. It made the situation more complex. These were irrational actors, rather than these were actors who were members of the communities that we were supposed, supposedly serving. And they helped to build constituency and constituency is necessary to push through political agreement along with coalition. And so what I'm trying to get at here at a theoretical level is that there is no way toward a sustainable Israeli-Palestinian peace. I think this is true in many other conflict zones around the world without accounting for and incorporating uh, religious actors, constituencies, whatnot in the processes and the, in the eventual outcomes. Um, and I think this is one of several key reasons why um, Oslo failed. Not the only reason, but it's one central reason is that we had this sort of idea that we could just will religion away and we didn't. And in fact, many of these actors and these groups um, took an anti-negotiation stance <laughs> precisely because of our, our um, ignorance and um, and uh, sort of animosity towards them. I th so, so that first step is may seem very basic, but I think it's fundamental and it's critical. And just a small footnote there, I think, you know, one of the great stories that the, um, you know, we missed in the public square in the 2016 election was the role of faith um, in um, here in the States. One of the stories that we're missing now is the religious dimensions in Russia and Ukraine, um, which are very much there and very much present. So I, I have an almost evangelistic zeal to communicate this to this particular audience, because I think um, it's necessary for us not to view this as we all need to become theological experts or whatnot, um, but to understand that this is a force. And a rubric to think of um, how we think of religion um, in terms of real politic, because it is, um, given that we are religious beings, I think might be to think of this, you know, negotiations generally or conflict resolution in three broad buckets before we even think of the actors. And first is culture, second is constituency, and third is coalition. And these things interact to create the conditions within negotiations and potential conflict resolution happen. And religion is present and fundamental in all of them. Religion shapes culture. It's often the form of culture. There are religious constituencies. You asked me about my work with evangelicals. I grew up Palestinian and Danish American. Um, I have a huge family outside of Bethlehem, but from a Christian tradition. So I always knew that there were other Christian actors in the West who were speaking into the reality on the ground and very much shaping the politics, including America's posture towards Israel-Palestine. And so, you know, there's never a scenario in the new future, I see somebody in the church chat put something about the Holy Land in which these communities are not going to be involved. So the question is how? Are they going to be spoilers or are these folks going to live more deeply into their values, not convert to my values, um, but play a more constructive role? The um, short conclusion there is they actually can. And I've seen this time and time again and happy to talk more about this. And, and I think Gary um, is, um, is one of the experts in, in, in this area as well. Um, I feel like I could speak for so much longer, but I'll just leave with this one, one per perhaps hopeful thought here is that I think that many of us who might sort of agree with the notion that it's essential to learn how to engage faith-based actors, whether leaders or their constituents, to drive systemic change, still have this anxiety that, oh my gosh, these folks are irrational. How can we do this? How can this crazy person over here change their perspective? The fact is that religious people are just like all of us on this call and equally um, lead equally as rich um, inner lives, um, often very rich communal lives um, and are questioning. They have, they, they question, they seek to live out um, their deepest values here. And I've seen this time and time again, where, for example, many American evangelical Christians go on similar journeys that Ilana just shared with us about her transformation um, regarding Israel-Palestine, and it's true everywhere. So this is possible, but the challenge of our time in this particular moment is not only to sort of accept that religious actors um, play an essential role in co-creating this reality that we live in, but to understand that to push through a successful negotiations process, we'll need to learn how to build coalitions together with people whom we might disagree with on other issues. And so um, I'll leave it there, Jim. So this is, this is really interesting. And a lot of times when people think of negotiations, they think of what happens at the table among the you know, negotiators themselves. But 
behind the table, away from the table, are the players that actually make the negotiations work or fail. And so much of what you've described, and when I say you, I mean Greg, you, Ilana, and Gary, have been actions, if you will, behind the table, either very generally building support or antipathy toward um, toward these, uh, you know, toward the the negotiations when they've actually taken place. But I'm I'd like to sharpen the the question a little bit and um, and ask again, starting with Gary, the role that faith leaders, and I'm thinking Catholic and Protestant in, in, in your case, Gary, specifically, played close to the actual negotiations. And I'm thinking of the ones in particular leading to the Good Friday Agreement, because there was certainly much ferment more broadly and many connections. But what's much less visible is what was done in, uh, you know, vis-a-vis the more formal negotiations at, uh, at that point. I'd be curious, and really I'd like to ask the same question of, uh, of Ilana and Greg, either what has been done or could or should be done and how that might help. Yeah. Gary? It's, in, it's interesting, Jim, it's a great question. As you know, my colleagues here with me virtually tonight know I've hosted around a thousand Palestinians and Israelis in Belfast over the last 10 years. And I say to them when they come here, look, I'm not giving you a blueprint for peace. I'm not saying here's the Good Friday Agreement, take it back to the Middle East, all will be well. I simply just want folk to leave this space, Jim, saying three words, maybe, just maybe. So I often say, how do I breathe the oxygen of hope into a space, namely the Israeli-Palestinian theatre, where there's not a lot of hope? Most Israeli-Palestinians say to me in the course of dialogue, they, there's a number of things they say are lessons they take home. But every time, Jim, this comes up without contradiction. It's, Gary, you don't understand. And I say, tell me, what do I not understand? And they say, we don't trust each other. I go, really? And I say, do you really think in the late 1980s as a very young, naive clergy person, when I went into the room for the first time with people who were killing each other, it was like champagne and all hugs and kisses. There were people in the room who hated each other, who wouldn't look at each other, who lowered their gaze when they spoke to the other person. And I think it's important, Jim, that religious leaders say this categorically. A lack of trust between opposing sides is an inevitable feature of building peace but it cannot be used as a justification for not beginning the process. Trust doesn't come at the start of a process. It evolves over time through dialogue, many, many times secretly, making, meeting commitments, building confidence, through, as Alana said earlier, concrete actions. And I think religious leaders can be trusted people in relation to this. Hearing the stories, shaping the narrative and painfully trying to move people forward. And that begs me to ask the question of all of us, how do we use sacred space? And there are many academics in this tonight. How do we use academic space? Do we use our sacred space for division? Do we use our sacred space for antagonism? Um, I know from a colleague in the Middle East who will be nameless, but you alluded to there, Jim, earlier on that one of the most lethal uh, paramilitary groups pursuing political violence, terrorism, whatever phraseology you want to use, read their weapons decommissioning statement out from my church building. And I know a number of uh, Arab, and I've shared this with Greg, a number of Arab imams and sheikhs, because of the violence in Arab societies at the moment within Israel, have wrestled with the question, what is the role of our sacred space in trying to move weapons out of Arab society? So how do we use sacred space well for good? Because many times we don't want another person of the other side in our sacred space. But the New York Times uh, correspondent, Brett Stevens said, in order to disagree well, you must understand well. How do we use academic space? How do we use sacred space to allow people who are opposites 
to learn to understand the other person's narrative. And as I've often said in many of these conversations, if I was born in the other space, what decisions would I have made? And I think religious actors can ask some of those what we call uncomfortable questions to allow uncomfortable conversations in a way that politicians may not be able to. So Gary, this is really helpful. I hear you saying, you know, bringing the moral framework and moral authority to these spaces, promoting understanding, slowly building trust. And this is not an intervention in the formal processes of negotiation that you're describing, but really influencing the conditions that can make them more, more promising and, uh, and more likely to succeed and be sustainable. Ilana, you've done lots of work. You started with education, then education leading to action. Do you see a role for the kind of work you do or others do that, uh, that, that would link um, more to the more formal processes when they're happening? Because of course, many times they're not. But uh, what, what is your experience and your, uh, your, your vision on this? Right, right. We're not in a time of any formal process taking place right now, which you know, on one hand is unfortunate. On the other hand, when the sides are as unequal as they are, it's actually a forced fit, I think, in order to sort of um, create a fantasy that there can be negotiations um, between such, such profound inequity. I think in order to, uh, well, first I'll state what I think is, is the obvious, which is part of why I'm here, which is that I think that as, as uh, Greg and Gary have both said, this only works, any of these kinds of conflict um, resolution practices are only gonna be long-term successful if we include religious leaders. So I, I'll speak a little bit about some of the work I've done with rabbis and, and how I see the work with rabbis. Um, I think first it's, it's just crucial to understand the, the extremely sacred place of Israel in Jewish peoplehood. And anyone who's gonna sort of step into this world, um, I think it's sort of incumbent upon all of us to understand, just as I think it's important to put ourselves in the shoes of the other Palestinians to also put themselves in the shoes of how Jewish religious leaders are seeing the land of Israel. They're seeing it um, both historically as the place of the birth of the Jewish people of Eretz Yisrael, that's Hebrew for the land of Israel, the biblical sacred ancestral land of Israel, as well as Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel, a political nation state that played a crucial role in the salvation of the Jewish people after the Holocaust. Um, so putting ourselves in the shoes from the, a Jewish religious leader in that way is crucial to engaging rabbis to play a constructive role here, to first extend ourselves to what they, what they see. Um, but there's another part that is not spoken about so frequently, but I'm gonna share it here because I, I think it's relevant. Um, there's something of an irony in the role of religious leaders in the West Bank who are settlers. And settlers are sort of hands down seen as an obstacle to the peace process because if there is going to be a Palestinian state, a large chunk of it is gonna be in the West Bank. The irony here is that a significant number of the settlers are religious Jews. And they more so than secular Jews who may live in a city like Tel Aviv are the people who come into contact more often with Palestinians than secular Israelis who might live in Tel Aviv or Haifa. Now, it's hugely problematic because it is in large part because of the settlers who live in the West Bank that we have this obstacle to a negotiated solution. But at the same time, it's also these same people who not only come into contact with Palestinians on a much more regular basis, granted as occupiers, which is a far from ideal relationship, but they're also the people who are so deeply attached to the land that if we don't extend ourselves to them, if we don't find a way for them to be understood and for them to be part of the process, they're gonna remain an obstacle to any kind of peace negotiations. So any kind of state level negotiations that are gonna take place have to include the actual faith rabbinic leaders who are entrenched in this conflict. Again, a kind of involvement that we have not overtly seen, but 
And when I when I turned to Greg with a similar question, Greg started off by saying one ingredient in his view of the failure of the Oslo process was its almost militantly secular orientation. And uh, to say, look, we, the last thing we want is to turn this thing into a religious conflict, even though the religious elements are so powerful. Let's treat it as a secular issue that's resolvable. Religious conflicts aren't. And um, and and where I'm where I where I'm kind of have a have a hole in my understanding, Greg, is um, the importance that Gary and Ilana have talked about mutual understanding and seeing things from the other side's point of view and and slowly building trust. I love the expression to disagree well, we must understand well, as opposed to disagree blindly or for false reasons. But you seem to be saying something more and I about uh, about more of an overt relationship between faith leaders and, uh, and, and political negotiations when they take place. Am I misreading you or do you have a uh, do you have something more specific in mind? Um, no, I mean, I'll say from the beginning of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, for um, for example, faith has always been there. So if we take sort of the perspective that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is over a century old, um, thereabouts, for example, evangelical Christians um, were pushing for um the fulfillment of the Zionist um, mission from the very beginning. Lord Balfour, Balfour Declaration, was an evangelical Christian with this partic particular um, theology, as was Sykes of the sykes pico Agreement. How much they actually sh shaped their political decisions. There's a there's there's you know a lot of historical debate about that. But the reason why I'm mentioning that is we can say that faith leaders, religious constituencies were not sort of ostensibly or formally part of modern negotiation processes, but faith is and has always been there. The key stakeholders in a lot of our politics and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict motivate themselves and are located in faith communities. So if we, as folks who ascribe to this model of negotiations and to real politique, actually want to live our values, um, our values mean sort of making an assessment of the way the world is and operating within that framework. And we've been rejecting the core principles of real politique when it comes to Israel-Palestine, I think when it comes to so many other issues around the world, in that we have been trying to segment out faith leaders, faith constituencies from these processes as, um, as irrational actors. When they are building power, building movement, and exerting their power in very profound ways. And so, yes, I am saying something beyond just sort of that, you know, faith leaders can call us to a moral question. They can do that. They can also turn us against each other. Faith has been weaponized, and it is weaponized in many instances. What I'm making is a precedent point here that I think is particularly critical for this time, whether with respects to Israel-Palestine or any of these other global issues, and that is that faith does manifest in real world material power. To believe otherwise is delusional. And so we have a big gap in our understanding as well as a massively missed opportunity to drive systemic change when we ignore these constituencies. And one small footnote here, I saw a comment or a Q&A about the fact that, you know, the panel is not a diverse panel and totally true in many respects. I mean, we're talking about Israel-Palestine, um, you know, I myself am progressive. I come from a Palestinian Christian background, um, for example. Um, that that's that's absolutely true. And I think um, you know when we're talking about um, not this panel, but doing this work in the real world, we have to find ways. And there are models that are effective, by the way, of engaging a variety of people from very different backgrounds. Um, we need inclusive processes that have stakeholder support on the ground. We're not gonna airlift shiny, happy people from Southern California to Israel-Palestine to live out an Israeli-Palestinian peace, whatever that looks like in one state, a confederation, two states, whatever it is. Um, the people who are going to be living out that reality are the people living that reality now. And that includes uh, uh, populations that predominantly ascribe to some kind of faith worldview. This is, uh, this is quite helpful. And what I think I hear is, don't imagine that the role of, of faith leaders is one that's sort of quiet and slowly building education and trust and, uh, and the things that can enable 
uh, a productive agreement. But rather, many faith leaders are extremely active in the political arena in ways that profoundly influence the negotiators directly, even if they're not parts of the negotiating process. And so you have that power that's being exerted, but somehow not either acknowledged or, or, or dealt with in, uh, in the coalition building and, um, and, and sort of constituency support for, as opposed to the spoiler role that these, uh, that these parties often, uh, often play. I, um, I think at this point, uh, I'd, I'd like to turn to some of the questions from, uh, from the audience. There are many. And, um, and I would, uh, and a, a sort of a, a, a provocative question for um, really for any of you is, is it your experience that these disputes are mainly political disagreements that faith exacerbates or faith conflicts that exacerbate the political conflict. And I know that they're inseparable in important ways, and maybe it's not useful to think of one versus the other. But if, for example, these are fundamentally political conflicts that take on a religious form, that's a rather different prescription than the reverse, right? Or a different situation than the reverse. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me start with Gary on that one. Yeah. I mean, I've often said, Jim, as regards national identity, there's nothing wrong with nationalism in and of itself. It's okay to be Israeli, Palestinian, American, Irish, French. The difficulty is when you deal with ethno-nationalism and you combine religion with that, invariably you end up with what I call theologies of superiority. And so you begin to look down on the other person. Uh, so we become, I do some of this work in the US at the moment around this, for God is on my side mentality. And that pervades so much of politics. Uh, so you get that combination of religion and politics together. I think one of the questions we need to ask is, how do we depoliticize religion? I mean, not to bring the whole American space into it, but the whole debate within the US at the moment about a sort of white American folk religion that's not really based in any biblical texts, but it's more a cultural aspect. And that pervades so much of all these spaces. I mean, just we very earlier there alluded to the whole concept about Ukraine. I'm not gonna drill into it too much, but I mean, in reading around it, I know I sent Jimmy an article the other day about it. I mean, one reporter was saying that he interviewed Putin in 2013. Putin was wearing a cross around his neck. He, he discovered that he had been secretly baptized by his mother as his father was an atheist. Why is he delegitimizing Ukraine? And many commentators slowly are beginning to twig onto the fact is he believes that Ukraine is part of Russia's history, culture, and religious space. And if you were to take this way, way back, I'll not drag this out too much, Way back to nine, nine, not 1988, 988, I can hardly say it because it's a time, it's a phrase we never even use. In Kiev, the first Christian convert, Vladimir was his name, King, summoned the whole city to the banks of the Detna River for a mass baptism. Holy Mother Russia was born. And Putin has said, that is what unites Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. But what happens in 2019? The Ukrainian church breaks with the Russian church and declares its independence. Is it really that they want to take Kiev because it's the capital, geographically, of Ukraine, or because of a religious knowledge going back hundreds, in fact, over 1,000 years? And that is a toxic nature. As I often say, when conflict starts, there's three areas. Land, this is my land, not yours. Identity, my identity is superior to yours. And religion, my theology is superior to yours. That's a toxic, toxic mix. The, um, thanks, Gary. I, we have a couple of questions that I might pose initially to Ilana and then, and then our other two panels. And it's, it's a very specific one. And it's, uh, it's, it, it builds on this, on this concept that, uh, that Gary talked about, the theology of, of superiority and God is on our side. And Ilana, when you, when you deal with traditionally observant settlers 
who really see this as sort of God commanded land um, and uh, and and to 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 budge on that is to betray their faith. Do you see uh, do you see any way that um, um, that that or how in your experience that that perception can either be softened or turned to uh, to something more constructive or is this just an unconditional obstacle that has to be overcome? I don't see it as as something to overcome. I, I similar to what Greg was saying. I don't think we can see anything in the religious dynamics is something to just overcome. I think we have to see ways to expand the framework. And I don't, I wouldn't wanna overstate these openings among the religious settler population because I don't think the openings are huge, but I think there are some that are there in which religious settler leaders don't wanna be forced to leave, but they don't mind if other people stay. And so part of what we're seeing, we haven't gotten into this dynamic, but I will throw it into the mix around the sort of the two state solution, the one state solution. Part of what we're starting to see, and we're seeing it both in, I think in the religious sector, but also in secular sectors, is an increasing understanding that if nobody wants to go, then everybody's gonna have to have the same rights. And what I have heard from some religious rabbinic leaders in the West Bank is, they're actually completely fine with Palestinians having equal rights within a political nation state framework, as long as they themselves don't have to go. Now, is that what Palestinians might want? I don't know, I, I won't I in any way pretend to speak for Palestinians and that, that just opens up a whole other kind of perspective to look at the situation. What if from a re religious rabbi's faith-based perspective, they, they refuse to leave a certain, what they see as God-given land, but they can also expand their um, political and religious viewpoint to allow for others to coexist peacefully alongside them. But there's one other piece that I wanted to throw in that we didn't mention, perhaps because we're so far away from the Oslo time period, just to loop back, Jim, to what you were asking about. You know, I, I think it's just worth we're taking a moment to remember that the person who assassinated Yitzhak Rabin was a very right-wing religious Jewish person. I mean, if ever there was a reminder that we can't ignore the role of religious leaders in this context, the, the assassination of, of Rabin, a, an essentially largely secular Israeli religious leader by a religious Israeli Jew, it, it should serve as a constant reminder for why we need to be including religious leaders in these negotiations. And we know, of course, that Anwar Sadat was a was assassinated by an Egyptian, and the you know that's a that's a big risk that uh, that peacemakers run um, from their own side, if you will, on these situations. Greg, this the question of people, and here I'm thinking explicitly of those who deeply believe that, um, and I'm thinking of the settlers of which uh, Ilana was speaking. This land was given to us by God, and Ilana said, well, maybe there's another way not to, not to um, oppose that belief, but to expand the possibilities. You see that both from your work in the Middle East and in bring, bringing Christian Zionists to the area who very much support that. How do you see that, that really uh, issue that feels almost irreconcilable to many, ways around it, ways out of it, or uh, areas of hope? Yeah, I mean, many of these first naming what the issues are and what is reconcilable and what is irreconcilable. And so, you know, we live with a lot of irreconcilable issues in pluralistic societies. Um, and the fact of the matter is we share mutually opposed worldviews in many instances. And we forget that as we build institutions that allow us to um, share resources and even political and national identities. Sorry to start with that theoretical point, but the point is just that like, you know what, I'm not going to convert you, Jim, just as you're not going to convert me. I'm not going to argue into believing something deeply differently about the world. This is just the fundamental rule of change and negotiation that I can invite you into a space in which perhaps you might be able to live a better, more deeply aligned version of yourself, to 
to have some sort of win-win in which you see the world and how you live your values in the world um, as, as somehow transformed in a way that is aligned with your worldview, not mine. So why these types of personal experiences are important, and I think important for all of us as human beings, but say for an evangelical Christian, I'm not inviting somebody to come and see the world as Greg sees the world. I'm inviting them to go on a journey to more deeply understand how they can better live their values in the world. And evangelical Christians want to be good people in the world. They may have certain theologies, but every religious tradition has multiple versions of the same theology. When those theologies come face to face with actual people, outcomes, when your realities are broadened by who you encounter, and when you be start to really sort of reconcile with, oh, did I have a particular bias? Was I overlooked something? Did I get something wrong? Is there a different way for me to live out what I truly believe in the world? Well, then we're on to something. Then we can work at a strategic matter. And so I've just seen this. I just have to say at a practical matter, for example, um, my co-founder at Telos um, is a Republican, former Bush political appointee, evangelical Christian from Arkansas. We met when I was on the negotiating team and we spent a day together in Jerusalem um, immersing ourselves in the stories and realities of Palestinian families um, there and um, some of the geopolitical considerations. And that sparked a transformation, which led many years later for him to want to devote his life to actually helping his communities um, see a more full story about this, which he's done for the past 13 years alongside me. I've seen this happen time and time again. We've all seen it in our own lives that this happens. Um, and so the one thought I would also leave is not just about the other, you know, the boogeyman, the rational spoiler, the religious actor, whether it's the rational orthodox settler or the evangelical Christian like my business partner, Todd. But what I would suggest as well is that so much of this work um, involves seeing our own blind spots. I think in this current moment, there's a progressive messianism where we have this aspirational view of the world where by we own rationality and reason. And if all these other people would somehow just see the world as we do, then we could arrive at um, negotiated solutions and shared institutions that make everything better for everyone. That's irrational and it's not rooted in any fair estimation of who we are as human beings. Um, what we need to do is we need to build inclusive processes that meet people where they are and understand that more often than not, win-wins are possible. That is possible, including with people who share very different worldviews. So the negotiation structures, the cultural advocacy, the constituency building that we do to enable successful negotiations need to depart from a place that really embraces the fundamental pr principles of rail politique that, um, that we all know on, on this call. And it is possible. In the instance where you have true spoilers, look, you know, it's like anything. Hopefully you can get people to see a different worldview, convert them for a lack of a better term. Maybe you can sap somebody's will to have sort of a recalcitrant perspective. That's one way to deal with it. And then there are those who will never change and we acknowledge that, um, but they will be isolated if they're different and um, uh, more sort of ecumenical narratives out in the public square um, that have expression in the halls of power as well. So I, I do think there are many ways to hope. In the words of one pastor in Bethlehem, a good friend, hope is, it's not an emotion, hope is a verb, it's what you do. And so for us on this call, that means actually taking seriously the fundamental principles of real politique and realizing that our religious counterparts are equal to us and um, are necessary co-creators of this reality. Greg, one of the things that you said, I think is, um, is important. Somebody's belief system may seem quote unquote irrational to someone else, but you're saying take that as a given and expand your understanding and not say that's irrational, I'm right. But in fact, take that, okay, that's how they believe, I understand that. And how can we find a way toward mutual tolerance, toward coexistence, toward a better outcome than trying to prevail? That that's a, something very, very different. I also very much like the juxtaposition between realpolitik, the political factors that um, that can that have to be taken into account for any kind of resolution, and say that religion is a piece of that. It's not apart from that. And I think that's a, an important realization. Sometimes one says the realm of the spirit and then the realm of the state, 
And you're saying that's a dangerous dichotomy. It's just wrong and it's uh, not, not gonna get there. You know, the panelists thus far, I think have, have really stressed the importance of mutual understanding, education, seeing our own blind spots and so forth. And a question from the audience um, really derives closely from the, uh, from the film, which is uh, critical reflections about the religious leaders in Northern Ireland who were cautious about taking strong stances, either because of concern from their own communities or a feeling that that was just not their place. And the question that the, uh, the, um, the, the audience member asks is, what do we need to do or what can lead faith leaders to take bolder bridge building actions rather than to hold back as, uh, as many chose to in, uh, in Northern Ireland? I'd be very interested. Gary, can I start with you? What, yeah. what can be done? And then I'd be curious, um, quick answers from, uh, from our other two. For me, I think, Jim, I would never be critical of another clergy person who was cautious about doing some of the things I did uh, for a multiplicity of reasons. Uh, a congregation that may have made their life miserable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I find one of the key things to existing in this was having a few good people around me. A few people that I were trusted friends. So I'll give you an example of that. When Joan Reed, who was the British Secretary of State, came to my church to meet with some people who were not moving away from violence as quickly as what they should. Uh, from a number of people, to use an Irish phrase, I got it on the neck. And there were a number of letters in a church magazine. I didn't respond to any of those letters. But other people who knew my heart and who knew my soul responded on my behalf. So I didn't want to go in there and defend myself. Other individuals who were part of a small circle who understood why I was doing what I was doing, to put it in more militant terms, fought that fight on my behalf. And I just felt that was important to do that. In that meeting, there was still violence going on, even after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, prior to that, there were a significant number of small pipe bombs were placed in different spaces. In fact, hundreds. And it was only a year after that that we looked back and realized the year after that meeting, there were five pipe bombs. So I didn't realize until a year later that that meeting, that engagement, that uncomfortable conversation, again in sacred space, was worthwhile. So sometimes it's looking back, I guess, for all of us, and for all our listeners tonight, through the corridors of time, that we see some of those, what I call thoughtful, prophetic, strategic risks. And I mean, I've been sort of following the chat here as well, and there's been a number of debates going on. What I would say to folk who are disagreeing in this chat, you may live in different cities, but have a coffee Zoom together. See the other person's face and wrestle some of those things that you're debating with a lot of passion there, to put it mildly, which is good, engage humanly with the other person. Don't leave what you've said tonight to veer into cyberspace. This is, this is wise. Um, Ilana, what, has, what have you seen that enables or impels religious leaders to take bolder actions in the direction we've been talking? I lift up a phenomenon that we're seeing in the American Jewish community, which is different than the Israeli community, and there is a relationship between them. But we're seeing a new generation of younger American Jews who are much more inclined to be empathic towards Palestinian perspectives and to be critical of the Israeli government, which I think in terms of any steps towards a negotiated solution is critical. And as a result of this younger generation's move, we're seeing an increasing number of older generation Jewish leaders, including rabbis, opening themselves up to hear from the younger generation. The, the rabbi in my university said, had a sign in her office that said, if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. So this encouraging note of this younger generation taking this leadership role um, is one of the ways that we can embolden our rabbinic leaders to also follow suit. Uh, 
And I think Greg has pointed to something similar in the mm -hmm. evangelical community, a divergence of view as between the younger and the older. And sometimes action takes, as Gary mentioned, a small group of people to reinforce and kind of buck you up as you take risky steps and other times it can uh, be led. I am, um, you know, this, this is such an interesting conversation. Um, and the, so many elements, the notion of culture and constituency and coalition where key stakeholders are religious, participants in um, either as spoilers or enablers and uh, in, 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 in a real politic thing. These are not different spheres. And uh, hope is not just an emotion, but what, it's, what it is that you do. There's just any number of, of, of valuable pieces of insight, but I would turn to someone with experience in both conflicts. And that's George Mitchell, who was a key architect of the Good Friday Agreement. And he cites something that I think is, 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 is quite interesting. He talks about the history in Northern Ireland, decades of bitter, brutal sectarian warfare had created public attitudes that were deeply negative and filled with despair. Just four days before the agreement was reached, a public opinion poll reported that 83% of the public believed that no agreement would ever be possible. Only 7% thought it might be possible. 10% had no opinion. But four days later, we had an agreement and it has mostly held with a lot of, and I think that that's what Mitchell said, that conflicts are created and conducted by human beings. They can be ended by human beings. And, um, you know, we, these things go on. We haven't had time to apply the, some of these insights beyond a, a, a light touch in, uh, in, 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 as between Russia and, and Ukraine. But I really want to thank our panelists for, uh, for both the human and political sides of their conversation. It's, uh, it's inspiring despite all of the elements of despair. Nicole? Yes, thank you so much to all of our panelists and thank you to you, uh, Jim, for this wonderful discussion. We really appreciate it. Thank you to all of our participants who tuned in with us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at uh, a future PON event. I will wrap up very quickly by letting you know that our next uh, PON Live is on March 18th on the very timely topic of Ukraine and Russia uh, with Bob Anukin, Alan Lampler, and Eugene Kogan uh, discussing uh, negotiations there. So we look forward to seeing you at a future PON event. Thank you everyone again, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day.